I thought geology deconstructed. I like it. And we'll just get that little blurb on there. Anybody wants to join in on that, uh, uh, share the link, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, we are theoretically broadcasting. Yay! Uh, and um, I'll say hi, Jackson. Jackson Wheat is here to uh, discuss uh, the wonderful world of creation science, flood geology, and the apologetic site. Hello! Uh, apologetic site of, of Genesis Apologetics, which I hadn't known about. I've actually put it on my bookmark to explore in due course, provided my brain doesn't fly in the heat, fry in the heat here. So give us kind of an introduction to how you stumbled onto uh, Genesis Apologetics and what you are regarding of same. Hmm. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think a creationist I ran across on Twitter posted a link to one of their videos, which I saw, which I went and watched on YouTube and noticed that they had disabled all comments for all their videos. So I sent them an email asking if they were on Twitter because I couldn't find anything under any Genesis Apologetics organizations on Twitter. So I, I sent them an email saying, do you guys have a website? And uh, they're on Facebook and they have they can't disable comments on on Facebook as far as I'm aware. And so I left them quite a lengthy uh response to their video on flood fossilization and geology so and then i told you about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I i put the thing on my bookmark what it appears to be is a series of uh, responses to a whole bunch of regular science books including mm -hmm. uh, miller and levine's uh, biology text which i'll go into uh, at some point, just out of the, the, the malicious curiosity I have to uh, cover all of the stuff. My, in, my suspicion, my prediction is that when I go in there, I will find zero new information. I will find reprises of other people's creationist argument, and we'll find out, you know, if anybody wants to take book on that as to how likely that's going to be. So, um, uh, you, you were fascinated with the biogeography issue. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, creation science, and that's a huge one, which just slams into flood geology, hook, line, and sinker. Which Give your ignored. take on that. They completely ignored it in the, uh, n n is it, um, uh, it's like the fossil record, at Noah's flood or evolution. That's like I think something like the name of that, the, the video. So they completely ignore biogeography. They're they're happy to talk about, or sorry, to misrepresent the fossilization process to misrepresent how many animals are buried in mass groups by that we can recognizably say were by floods they talk about living fossils as the or living fossils as though like they had a picture of like a frog a modern frog skeleton and then like a frog from like the middle jurassic or something and say see there's no evolution here which except you don't have to look too close to find out that you know, things aren't quite all the same on that one. Yeah, yeah, it, it's uh, to be fair, creationists have been ignoring biogeography from the get go. It's the, their killer problem because every single species that currently exists in principle has to be accounted for as a kind, it has to find a spot on the ark. And if you have a, a kind that proliferates after the flood, because you don't have enough space for millions and millions of, of specimens, uh, then you've got to figure out how you can get the existing speciation uh, examples in their present location and consistent with their fossil data, or try to account for why the fossilization is what it is uh, in uh, relationship to the flood. And boy, that's a tall order. That makes the Tower of Babel look like a pancake. <laughs> Yeah, it was, um, they mentioned, they didn't mention anything about biogeography, but the, I was thinking about something they said earlier today, uh, something that I jumped on when I first watched the video, but I've given it more thought and I've realized it's a lot sneakier than it, than I originally thought it was. Um, they said, they said, you look at, at dinosaur, at Mesozoic strata. And you see representatives of every major, of every alive major animal phyla, which I thought about for a moment and I thought, well, my first reaction was, why don't we see rhinos or elephants so or anything like, or anything like that? And then I thought, yeah, yeah, there you get into a problem. 
uh, yeah, because it, all of the Mesozoic, I uh, kind of paid more attention to a lot of this stuff because a lot of it's sort of in my next door neighborhood uh, because I uh, realized that there was the Niobara Seaway that extended up into what is now Kansas and Nebraska and all of that. So that was beachfront property. And you've got relatively little in the way of uh, Mesozoic deposits in Washington state. It's just, it's a terrible spot. If you're a, a, a Mesozoic paleontologist, you've got to go south or north. You got to go up to Drumheller or down to Utah, somewhere where you got some nice, cute little deposits. We've got all our pimple volcanoes up here and our mountain ranges that have occurred way more recently. They kind of mask a lot of that stuff. So um, uh, th there are, there's a, a natural landscape that you have to deal with. And uh, when you get down to the fiddly bit details, which, by the way, no creationist ever gets close enough to the data to notice, if you look, for example, in hadrosaurs, you can see how certain hadrosaur groups are apparently coastal and other ones are uh, highlands because they've been able to work out the biogeography and you can tell a lot of that because drum roll by the time you get the hadrosaurs you're in the world of angiosperms so you have all that pollen grain information that allows you to tell way more about climate and biogeography and wind patterns and all oh, it's just a staggering amount of of uh, landscapes that they can work out in tremendous detail if they have a lager state in deposit which you find occasionally the solnhofen is an example of that and mesel much later on on. Then you have even more data that you can plow in. If you're looking at marine deposits, you can easily see uh, that stuff. Once you get diatoms, which are coming in in the Cretaceous period, so you got a whole turnover and details, and it ain't what we're used to now. There are things which are ancestral, but you're quite right. There are no elephants. There are no large mammals. You've got some that are big enough that it, towards the tail end of the Mesozoic, they're actually starting uh, mammals that are, you know, pig size or so that are actually preying on small dinosaurs. And so you're starting to see perhaps the first sign that the dinosaur ecosystem is going through a little bit of a state change before uh, the final asteroid splat uh, uh, bumps everything down. But the, the, the sheer range of data appreciated how little of it gets on the anti-evolution scope until I started tracking the sources in tip. Now, now I don't have to guess. I can tell who cites what. I can look at what material it is and I can see, oops, you don't notice that. Oops, you don't notice that. Oops, you don't notice that. And it's a lot of not low notice. <laughs> yeah, they, they just totally ignore biogeography in the video. But, they, but what, what I noticed and what made it so so much sneakier the more i thought about it was that you know of course we're going to find representatives of the major animal phyla in the mesozoic the mesozoic ended only 65 million years ago which is not a lot at all and so i i realized it's not a tall order to look for major animal phyla of course they don't define what major animal phyla is they just say major well, the animal same thing phyla. pops up with um uh, uh good old um uh jonathan wells when he talks about the major animal phyla but usually they restrict this to the cambrian because mm -hmm. there they're talking about the origins although in it, to be pesky uh, absolutely nobody in the creationist community uh, will jump to a phyla as a created kind so why they go to all this trouble of, of bringing it up, yes, we're, the chordate phyla belongs in the Cambrian, while well, la-di-da, that uh, uh, tunicates uh, and, and us are all the same kind. Uh, no, I don't think they like that one the at all. They can't even and, yeah. have uh, hominids and uh, us as the same kind. So it, it's it's squishy. The, 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 if they were arguing that phylas were types or kinds and Denton over an intelligent design land doesn't even argue that point the phylum then becomes this vague catch-all like we're supposed to go ooh the phyla originated earlier well yipes so much uh, all of the vertebrates that we find in the Mesozoic are ones that are coming along uh, from the chordate phylum so a little wiggly mm -hmm. thing that looked like you know, Hykuella and, and Pacaya and all that bunch from the Cambrian 550 million years ago, uh, that stuff is proliferating over hundreds of millions of years of evolution into mm -hmm. new forms. Cretaceous, of course, which is such a huge period of time, is really fun because the teleost fishes, the, of which most modern fish are teleosts, the ones with the mm -hmm. fully developed swim bladder and all that, uh, that's coming along in the Mesozoic. 
in the plant land, the angiosperms, uh, the flowering plants are coming along. That's producing, by the way, a biogeographical in that and the, the herbivores because the older style high browsers like your sauropods are getting more and more marginalized into narrow local areas like in South America where the new angiosperms haven't come in and the angiosperm eaters haven't come in to operate off of them. If you look at triceratops or hadrosaurs with their kind of cheese grater uh, mouth battery, teeth batteries, uh, these things are designed to process plants that have the constituency of, of celery not something that you can just rake off with little uh, uh, simple teeth the way the sauropods handled it. So all of the sauropods get pretty marginalized except in niche markets where they still exist. Whereas the angiosperms mm -hmm. that are in an mm -hmm. arms race with their predators, angiosperms have a higher turnover rate and uh, the, the, the flowering plant is harder to eat but also uh, produces very quickly and so it can uh, operate against its working with pollinators and the insects are coming in and so you've got a whole new dynamic system that's happening uh, when you move into uh, that uh, framework and you're not seeing that in the connections when you look at the pre-angiosperm world in the Jurassic or the Triassic or earlier which is inexplicable in context. They've got to avoid the vast majority of the data, all the pollen data and all of the, the forensics about what kind of things are happening with isotope balances. Of course, they reject all the methods that you would have with that as well, like the radiometric dating. So it's essentially a giant shredder. If you think of the bodies being thrown into Fargo uh, in that old movie, uh, they're doing that with, with whole disciplines. <laughs> Yeah, someone, uh, we're getting some uh, side comments over there. BJ Price brings up the Denisovans uh, and Neanderthal, uh, the, uh, uh, the the genetic islands that we've got in our yeah. own genome. Yeah. Uh, that, said, oops, sorry. That's more biogeography. That's yeah. popping up in our human genome. Where yeah. that It depends on where you are and how you interbreed and how close the relatives are and how much takes. And right. that becomes right. a thing that cascades downstream. And modern demographers can have a field day hunting around through all those uh, haplotypes. And that's another data set that's effectively bioge uh, biogeographical, uh, paleobiogeographical, and yeah. they can't deal with it because yeah. it's just one moving target after another. Now, a point that I was raising up when, when we were going to start talking about this flood geology stuff that always strikes me interesting is what I call in Dynomania on observational wanderlust going somewhere really far away to their little pet examples that they read in the creationist literature. Uh, the, uh, the Lewis overthrust isn't used nearly as much as it used to, but when I was bumping into creationism in the 1980s, have you heard of the Lewis overthrust? The Lewis overthrust? Uh, yeah. No? It's not a bird, is it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, in a spot up at uh, Waterington Glacier National Park. It shows you how uh, creationism evolves over time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, that um, well, it's got the selective that, pressures on it. Things that were obsessive on this in the 70s and 80s, now it's kind of fades away, and they don't fiddle with it. What it is is an example of a a big slab of real estate that an apparent of younger rock that ha or your older rock that had slid down, kind of like snow sheeting off of a roof and forming a series of little mountain structures with little valleys in between that are resting on younger rock down the slope. Millions of years to happen, and we, we can measure all of the time frame in that involved. But this supposedly was an insoluble problem for things, and it supposedly was all formed through uh, creationism. The problem is, explain why the valleys in between the rocks. If this was all slobbed down in one big thing, why were there the gaps in between? And when you look at the fact that rock moves slowly, but in particularly in the era of plate tectonics, when we know much more about the dynamics of these things and can measure these things much better, um, it, it, it's just kind of gotten lost by the wayside. You don't even find polystrate sources being used as often in modern creationist apologetics than they were uh, back when I was uh, um, a kid, uh, just looking at this from afar. But you still find young earth creationists like Joe Sisniewski, uh and others who copy old creationist material that they read years ago they still keep on throwing it out. Hey, maybe they're the they're learning. Yeah, join. I actually mm -hmm. um, oh, I just com I commented on the uh, 
on the little side conversation on on uh, hominins. Uh, but uh, also the there was a group that came to LSU um, shortly before the, the second semester ended called Truth on Display. And they were mm. creationists. And uh, it's always ironic mm. that the people who are least truth likely to tell you the truth about reality have truth in the name. They got the truth. The truth in science. One of the creationist websites uh, that I uh, lambasted in Slam Dunk is uh, the truth in science bunch. They're over in Britain. And I go, yeah, you're the last people on earth to be able to wave that one around. But um, <laughs> they were actually one of the guys. <laughs> well, I was talking. There were like two guys. There was a younger guy and an older guy. And the younger guy... Or, Interestingly, the older guy, uh, short side note, told me that he used to be an atheist and was the head of the atheist club at some university. Um, very vague detail. Yes. What? Uh, it could very well be. It wouldn't necessarily surprise oh. me. Yeah, oh, no. Do a cake, yeah, no. Go through I, phases, you know, yeah, such is life. No, yeah, I, I, um, I agree. I just said... <laughs> I, I wanted to ask him though, when did you become so gullible? But uh, <laughs> but I didn't. Yeah, if, if, he he very. Uh, I bumped into oddball in our own uh, uh, free thinking secular groups. Uh, just because you bump into somebody, you always have to be very careful about uh, that. There's atheism and there's atheism. Uh, that uh, they're not necessarily reasonable people. Tortugans can be atheists just like uh, religious. Right. Yeah. Uh, so. They, there's, there's no restriction on this. Uh, Tortuganosity is an equal opportunity affliction. And so the, the, the main thing is methodology. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 it's one of the tropes also in the conversion syndrome that you want to upplay the notion that you were a sinner, mm -hmm. particularly in the Protestant subculture. And so you want to have the idea that you were a benighted atheist, you were a Darwinist, you had all the wrong things and then you saw the light and saw the true reasoning and discovered all the right things of Andrew Snelling and the rest was wonderful and you're happy-go-lucky. But I would contend that if somebody become a creationist as an adult, they've got to have that Tortugan mindset of not thinking about things they don't want to think about. And I suspect they had exactly the same mindset when they were an atheist, that they were probably a piss-poor atheist and not very careful on stuff and may have been uh, an annoying arguer. Uh, who knows? Uh, oh, yeah, but yeah. Um, I doubt bad reasoning that quickly. It's it's probably ingrained in their thought processes from ways yeah. back. I mean, I have no way to evaluate his background, so I just have to take his word for it as of right now. Yeah. But it just, it, it it's always funny, and you're right, it, it's really funny because they say, you know, it's like, I was an atheist, they say that, and then they say things that I've never heard anyone who's seriously, who who's interested in the position... <laughs> And, and talk to them about it regularly. Say they'll say things like, like uh, C.S. Lewis did, who has been touted as by apologists as an atheist who became Christian, even though when he was a quote atheist, he was angry at God for not existing, which no rational person would say. <laughs> well, there's a, there's a long spectrum here. Uh, Lewis is just a fascinating example because he comes from that world of, he's kind of a conservative in a world of flaming post-World War I hyper-liberalism Marxists. And uh, uh, so he's bucking the, the trend. Uh, somebody who was a close buddy of his, uh, uh, J. Uh, R. R. Tolkien, um, uh, comes from the similar background. Tolkien uh, converted to Catholicism. Whereas a uh, um, good C of E guy, uh, Lewis, couldn't quite go that far. He got perilously close, but he couldn't quite manage it. Um, uh, but the thing is, is that apologetic framework, that they had a deep-seated need, and I can understand the, the context of it, in the kind of hyper-rationalist, that scientism ad attitude of Bertrand Russell and others, that they, you, you, got, you had people in the 1920s and 30s who were thinking in a kind of an H.G. Wellsian way that reason and science were going to triumph completely and all the old cobwebs of the past, like religion, are going to be wiped away. And from our framework, 100 years later, we're going, Oh, no, 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 no. There's not a snowball's chance in hell of that happening, buckaroo. And we now know a hell of a lot more about, about the neurobiology of religion and why belief systems function the way they do. And I, for one, am not expecting atheism to become the dominant philosophical system ever, <laughs> let alone. I mean, the evidence is not the dynamic here. 
it has to do with uh, social dynamics, it has to do with personal predilections, it has to do with a whole bunch of stuff that are deep ingrained in the things that make us human. So I'm, I'm not at all expecting that. Now what I do look forward to is a world in which you have much more ingrained secularism at the that you know anybody can believe what they like, but they can't co-opt the state to further their ideological agenda, religiously. And uh, unfortunately, we've got the most culture camp friendly administration ever. I just put a post up on my Facebook page about this uh, thing, where apparently most of the cabinet attends um, weekly Bible study with this hyper conservative Bible guy, Doringer, I guess his name is. And uh, it was uh, the, the group was set up by Pence, who's been too busy running around being um, um, clueless. And what uh, is to, he doing uh, again? <laughs> that, and that's why, uh, uh, um, just uh, 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 truth in advertising here, uh, that um, I would not want to see Trump impeached. Turning nope. is we're going to have Vice President Pence become president. Culture camp for her. And so he, unlike somebody who is a deranged, wacky bully like Trump, who has apparently very little ideology at all other than just Trump, Money. Uh, Pence has a precious um, ideology. And it's all that of the, of the, the, the creationist, culture camp, gay bashing worldview. Uh, Mr. That, Speaker, uh, I implore you to let both sides be taught in schools. Yeah. Yes, that's let's let's and let's do that for that flat earthism. You know, let, let's teach teach both sides of the globalist controversy, uh, except one side is complete twaddle and giving it the elevation of though it's equal is not any help. Uh, <laughs> anyway, the uh, uh, we're very far away from the flood geology thing. The, the the point I was bringing up initially was how flood geology has one delicious advantage from an empirical point of view. <laughs> if it were real, it would be really identifiable. When I was first looking in, in the creationist movement that was popping up in the 1980s, I was saying, okay, tell us what we're supposed to be seeing in the fossil record. And apart from ad hoc attempts to accommodate the existing geological data, mm -hmm. they were really vague about the fiddly bits. And one thing that I really realized about that operational wonderlust problem is that Finding evidence for the flood should be as easy as looking at your feet. Go to the Lewis overthrust. You shouldn't have to go to the Grand Canyon or anywhere far away. Look down. Supposedly, the flood was everywhere. So you don't need to go far to look it. The problem mm -hmm. is that they ain't going to do that. And they're never going to be able to make it fit. Uh, you get a few efforts. I think my, uh, Ord or Woodmerap. I think it was Ord who did this long a set of postings where he went around and, and pigeonholed a bunch of geological spots around the United States and that as uh, the flood deposit. Mm -hmm. Offering any detailed analysis of them, just simply proclaiming them to be, that's the flood deposit. But then again, in effect, everything is the flood deposit for all practical purposes. So, I mean, well, it, it, was, it was kind of redundant. <laughs> yeah, uh, virtually everything with fossils in it by definition because they claim that fossilization is intrinsically a catastrophic event. So for all practical purposes, if it's fossilized, deposit. Well, and uh, that's a it into. Yeah, I mean, we, we also, well, there are a lot of things we shouldn't have today if the flood actually happened, such as travertine, oil, salt, uh, these other, yeah, these other things that take, that take long periods of time with like high pressure or exposure to wind, et cetera, yeah. to form. Yeah, there are a we lot should... of very specific metamorphic rocks that are physically impossible to do unless you can cook them for longer than the flood time at a depth and temperature that is just not feasible if this is all occurring in that weird, vague, super duper floody thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, the physics of it, the thermodynamics just goes right over their heads it would appear oh yeah yeah although you you your uh, um, apologia had uh, put up that link that i actually didn't have in my bibliography i think i'd heard of it before but i didn't realize it had become available public access that uh, sokolov and and the uh, nelson paper from the oh, yeah, 1980s and uh i'm i've got that because now full text 
So I, I always love the people that I bump into in some of these things. A lot of the material already is in tip, but every once in a while I encounter a cute little analysis because what it's clear the picture that's shaping up is the evolution of flood geology. Hmm. We're starting out in the 60s and 70s. They were basically talking vapor canopy and or ice canopy. Yeah. And there would be a lot of water coming down there. There wasn't a huge focus on the waters of the deep stuff that Walt Brown is going to play with later on. And they were envisaging the pre-flood world as essentially the post-flood world. The continents in the normal position because this is pre plate tectonics. And, and the, the Henry Morris brand of creationist in the 1970s rejected flat out any continental drift. They didn't like that at all. And you can, if, if you're familiar, there was a, 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 I'll do a little back lesson on Velikovsky. I've mentioned him occasionally before on some of the other stuff. And I was a Velikovsky in, when I came into college in the early um, 70s. And I cringe at how, if I, if time travel me went back to talk to me in 1970, I would be whoopsiding my up self up the head saying, you jerk, learn sound method, you're an idiot. And I probably wouldn't have believed me. But anyway, that it impressed me about Velikovsky and catastrophism was the idea of the ice age in India. And Velikovsky was pointing out that the ice age went from the equator northward, which you would go, how is that possible? Well, <laughs> at just the time, was now hitting the fan when I was discovering it. Uh, and one of the things that made me realize, no, Velikovsky and catastrophism was way behind the curve and, and simply wrong, is that when India had its ice age, it wasn't where it is now. It was down in the Southern Hemisphere. It was parked down next to Antarctica and Australia. It was where a giant glaciation during the Silurian, the ice was going from the pole northward expect ice ages to do if they're built on a polar thing. And so all of that basically pulled the rug out from under a lot of the catastrophic arguments uh, that were coming online. And of course, you still had the uh, the cliche of the frozen mammoths and all these kind of flash frozen stuff, which is popped up a little bit in creationist apologetics, but much less. Now they've had to mutate along. The, the early generation of critics of, of flood geology were pointing out obvious stuff like you've got to flatten the mountain ranges. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if Mount Ararat's the top mountain, then everything else has to form after the, the flood. You've got to accommodate how much water you've got. And so even if you include waters of the deep, where does the water come from and what happens to it afterwards? And if you've got continents shifting around and stuff doing all of these fantastic things, you've got thermodynamic issues of heat transference. You've got stuff, uh, If you, what was the problem with the, uh, the vapor canopy notion that if you made it thick enough to pull off the kind of water flood they wanted, it would be impervious to the wavelengths that plants need to survive, the red wavelength. Well, <laughs> and just, just, just one problem after another. So what I mean, you that wouldn't even be the, the biggest problem that, I don't mm -hmm. even think that would be the, the biggest Jumping. problem with the vapor canopy. I think the biggest problem would be that the pressure necessary to sustain a structure like that would leave nothing alive <laughs> or heat. The pressure. It was the problem. Yeah. And I, I remember in the early 80s, uh, uh, Carl Baugh, who's still knocking around in creationism circles, and he connects up to your Paluxy River tracks bunch, and, and he's oh, yeah. kissing cousin yes. with and all that. Yeah. Uh, he pops up. He still does some shows, I think, on the 700 Club. I haven't seen them in quite a few years, but he's still knocking around, and he basically looks ageless. You know, he looks like the used car salesman that really wants to sell you that Edsel. Anyway, <laughs> uh, he um, uh, in the early 80s, he was pronouncing trying to create a Dimetrodon dinosaur. His words, barbaric chamber. And he was going to do this by taking a Gila monster, and he thought that all he had to do was to increase the pressure to simulate the flood pre-flood environment, and it was going to turn into this giant Dimetrodon dinosaur. Uh, tiny problems, A, Dimetrodons aren't dinosaurs. Uh, B, Dimetrodons are synapsid reptiles on our side of the evolutionary fence, the one that leads off to mammals. And so to take a diapsid, transform it into a, a Dimetrodon of any type, uh, would require a miracle way bigger macroevolution in one shell burst uh, than anything evolution has claimed as feasible. And of course, needless to say, we didn't get any announcement of any Dimetrodon dinosaur popping out of his hyperbaric chamber. I think 
He claims that he's made some flies that have lived supposedly unusually long. Which we which isn't and that far fetched. I mean, considering that he's yeah. And then the other is probably because they don't swat them, and uh, and 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 maybe because they're so lethargic in that hyperbaric pr plane, they just don't bother me, man. I just want to sit here and chill. And then he supposedly created a, a more um, fake venom, like this is a good thing to have in the pre-flood world. I don't know, but at, at any rate. It's uh, it's a strange and as yet not detailed publication uh, anywhere in the happy little world of, of Karl Baugh. It's, it's kind of like... Um, uh, oh, we're having the, a drinking uh, the, the game, are we? Yeah. Oh, oh, somebody's got... Oh, Karl Baugh, drink! Hey, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, uh, are you uh, having a, a series of lists of, of people on there that are the ones that deserve a drink? What are the rules? Uh, yeah, Karl Baugh. He's in that lower echelon of um, uh, flaky creationists. Basically, I kind of draw the line at the Paluxy River tracks. Those are a good diagnostic. Um, and the other one would be Kent Hovind. So anybody who accepts Kent Hovind is instantly putting themselves in a special demographic subset of creationism right off the bat. And oh, yeah. anybody who still trots out the Paluxy River tracks, for those who don't know, uh, the Paluxy River tracks are supposedly where there are the footprints of human beings next to dinosaurs, and therefore proof that humans and being human beings and dinosaurs coexisted. Aha! Well, it apparently is actually due to the, the, the dinosaurs tend to walk a, a digitigrade on their toes, but they're perfectly capable of planting their feet down occasionally and producing a plantigrade thing where the heel hits, and it's the theropod heel that's showing up every once in a while, that some creationists uh, decided were, in fact, uh, human footprints. Uh, the idea that a series of, um, uh, occasionally creationists will gussy it up a little bit by carving little toes uh, to fit, uh, that, and there's a print that, that Karl Baugh keeps on throwing around that's most yeah, a fake or anything. Yeah. They were originally discovered, by the way, in the 1930s by a guy named Bird. And I think the they took casts of them, and I think the Museum of Natural History in, in, in New York has uh, an, the, the, the kind of casting of them. And they've, they've pretty well determined that it was an Acrocanthosaurus, which is a modestly side, sized allosaur uh, that lived down in that re particular region. And unusually, at about 100 million years ago, it's in that land between early and middle, uh, early and late Cretaceous that would be middle Cretaceous if there were more deposits, which there aren't. So it's uh, 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 an actual, air quotes, middle Cretaceous uh, uh, geological deposit. Yeah, it's, I think I also read it was like, it was also partially, the, the metatarsal uh, imprint was also partially eroded, so it looked a little bit vaguely like a human footprint. They, they'll, they'll latch on to, the, the notion that, that an occasional human being was, was hovering a, a, a balloon and then once in a while the foot would come down and then there weren't like more footprints farther downstream you know, all the things that you would normally associate with organisms walking around in a natural environment like, he's like the hulk jumping around from one place to the next yeah 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 it's uh, well you know in the in the hyperbaric environment of the pre-flood question was this formed from the during the flood or not or before the flood when exactly were the polexi tracks and it, to give you an idea of how flimsy the argument was, John Morris, when he was actually dragged down there, almost kicking and streaming in the 1970s, um, he pretty much threw in the towel on it and said, yeah, this isn't really very good. And so he actually wrote some works on it. Well, you can date the creationist is by this area, because I still find young earth creationists who will cite the early John Morris pieces on the Paluxy River tracks and are completely oblivious to the ones he wrote a few years later where he said, oops. <laughs> Uh-oh. Ooh, this looks interesting. Uh, they're talking about David Peters. Mm. I know that guy. Um, oh, the yes. Guy. The, the, yes. Uh, I, I actually put a warning up on there about, yes, he's the dinosaur heresies guy. Yeah, he also oh, did the... Um, yeah, he did the thing, the paper that was like pterosaurs didn't walk on their, uh, their front, the the wings. They like walked with their wings up above, raised above the ground. Yeah, which yeah. is well, and, well, even for a, a brief period, uh, even um, uh, Phil Curry uh, uh, got on the kind of uh, a bipedal pterosaur kick for a bit, but it, it, very quickly the rest of the paleontologists, you know, <laughs> no. bitch slapped him and pointed out, no, the data doesn't support this, and the tracks. 
No, the, the pterosaurs were quadrupeds, and they've actually worked out, Darren Nash and others, and uh, oh, uh, um, Unwin, Unwin in particular, he's written some wonderful books on the subject uh, that uh, have uh, clarified the material beautifully, and he's done dinosaur track analysis and all that kind of stuff, so um, uh, he's an excellent one on there. Yeah, Peters is one that ha I have a giant to him because of the fact that he is such an oddball that anything he puts out, I just avoid using because he's just too problematic. So even if he says one plus one is two, I would get another source for that and not have to depend on him for that. You know, just, just don't rely on it. Yeah. Uh, is yeah. It I, what, what is, um, what is, is terrible about it though, is that his work is so very extensive. If you type in reptile oh, yeah. evolution in Google, you will get his, he oh, has he's two prolific websites. is all made out. Oh yeah, he has, he has the two websites. Yeah, his his website is good looking. It's you know it, it looks really nice because the first time I bumped into it, I would be going oh okay, but you know it seems to be looking up. But then I would do additional research. I'm that way. Uh, mm -hmm. Never look to get always look the gift horse in the mouth. That that regardless of its content or whatever, you want to find out about stuff. By the way, he had actually been published in a real technical journal. Oh he yeah, had an article back in. The um, in the early 90s, I think, um, where he was kind of starting to field some of these things, but that's basically when he hit the shredder and people realized that his view is really oddball. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not too familiar with his argument the birds came from pterosaurs. Uh, I know he had odd views of pterosaurs, but you know the, the bird pterosaur argument just can't fly, if I may use a pun. <laughs> that it's just, it just this boop. Anatomically, the, 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 the difference between pterosaurs and birds are so striking in terms of the physical anatomy and the bone structure and all the other mm -hmm. kinds of stuff that it's just, whoa, um, yeah. you, you just don't uh, flesh it out at all. But um, he's... Lunch. He's yeah, what? Continue. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, he's up there with on, on my list with Eugene McCarthy. He's, he's that level mm. of weird for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. McCarthy is another oddball. I'm, I'm trying to reprise his. Uh, he was the one with talking about the ape chimp hybrid or something like that. The pig chimp hybrid. Yeah, I, I knew it was something that where, where you go, what? <laughs> and uh, he actually hasn't done a heck of a lot where he bumped into actual publication in technical literature. And so he's, he, uh, uh, there, are, there are a lot of these fringe ones. And the fun part is that some of these fringy types if they have the right temperament and the right connections, will end up in the intelligent design anti-evolution camp, whereas others will stay locked in an evolutionary context. And then you've got ones, well, far higher up on the food chain, uh, Alan Fiducia, for example, who's a legitimate scientist. Yeah. But boy, he's got his blind spots. And he's, uh, I, I call him in slam dunk, the Fred Hoyle of bird evolution. And uh, I'm afraid that's uh, kind of turning into the case on that one. <laughs> yeah, it's unfortunate because he actually, um, I think I was told like my, where I set my backpack when I went into work at the museum every day was like right near some of the papers he'd written, which I thought was kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> but um, Oh, and he's still, he's still very active. He, he publishes quite a lot, Fiducia, in uh, the AUK and in various journals because he, he's, he's a legitimate scientist. But boy, it's, it's a tougher and tougher road to hoe because... It's been one problem after another. Uh, the first was the discovery of feathered theropods, and then the discovery of much more of Cretaceous birds, and now much more on the developmental biology of things involving the formation of wings, and oh, then of course all it. the It's just one thing after another. Death by a thousand cuts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so it's um, th this isn't the first time that sort of stuff happens. If anybody um, is interested in uh, uh, the history of human evolution, um, I, I went into a lot of the background details of the single species hypothesis and what is now kind of a dead letter debate, which was multi-regionalism versus out of Africa. It turns out both sides were right and both sides were wrong. Uh, that, which is often the case in big scientific controversies, that you did indeed have pulses out of Africa gene flow going on and the Denisovans and the Neanderthals and all that just reinforced this idea that there was a lot of regional variation and now we can track that down in, in things that would have been impossible when I was 
uh, first studying the subject because you didn't actually have DNA from Neanderthals to look at, but now we do. Oh, hey, that's, we, yeah. Mm -hmm. Moving on. Well, anyway, veering away from, from the happy well, world of I was flood actually, geology. I was going to say that's actually a good segue back to flood geology because it makes you wonder uh, which hominins got on the boat, which ones got off. Yeah. And, well, remember, they're forced by their own logic. Here is the thing that always struck me, even uh, before I, I knew as much about dinosaurs and, and therapsids and stuff as I do now, is why does anything go extinct after Noah's Ark? Oh, Noah's Ark was terrible holding animals. The was to preserve all the kinds. And so why is it that it looks like with absolute monotonous regularity, if something is thought to be really, really old according to the conventional geology, death on it in terms of going extinct in the post-flood world. Where are the Demetrodons? Where are the Tyrannosaurs? Where, you know, you, you get um, a, a, a small subset of creationists that are forced by the air quotes logic believe that there are um, dinosaurs surviving down in Africa somewhere or mm -hmm. that there were uh, uh, stegosaurs surviving in Cambodia, that ridiculous case. Uh, but that's just a, a tip of the iceberg. You've got way more creatures than that. And so what happened to him? The, the ark apparently was a terrible preserver. Of the 8,000 kinds on the ark, portion actually are thought functionally to have gone extinct. That's why I'm so interested to someday either compile on my own or see a listing of um, how many kinds are supposedly in existence. The numbers get bandied about. Kent Hovind tossed out the 8,000 number. But the question is I don't have a damn list. Um, if we have a situation uh, where, say, all 20 families of dinosaur that are currently known, if each one of those is a kind, that even if you have the sauropod uh, stegosaur bunch as two that supposedly survived, that means 18 of the 20 went extinct. This is bad preservation. Uh, and why is it that you've got that happening with the, the therapsids and the early tetrapods and all that going back farther and farther and farther and farther and farther? Well, that's why I want to see the damn list. I have the damn list. Unlike <laughs> where I, I've frequently mentioned in my work where if you want to know how many orders of mammals there are or how many families of, of reptiles and that, you, you can find in the technical literature and the books, they have long appendices which will list every damn thing. And you can go through there with great detail. There is no counterpart of that in the creationist community. And what was stopping them? The only thing that was stopping them was they can't do it. <laughs> as simple as that. You remember uh, the, the article that Todd Wood wrote about Australopithecus sediba being in the human monobaramen. Yeah. So the question is, was our, <laughs> was our representative Noah an Australopithecus scene? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that puts a whole new wrinkle on Cain and Abel and all that little bunch. You know what all... Uh, uh, Adam the, and Eve, Australopithecines? <laughs> here, the, the problem is, and uh, I haven't analyzed in full depth all that hominid material or, or a lot of the baromenology literature. I've got it in tip, but I haven't looked at it at the level I did with the synapsids and uh, some of the stuff on uh, the bird claims and that because I, I, I had to cover that for, for the purposes of slam dunk. But what I suspect is going on is the problem. You're, you're familiar with how baromenology works. Take the cladistic data, yeah. all that, those bunches of numbers that mm -hmm. they didn't compile, the evolutionists did, and then they plug them into these formulas, which basically do a three-dimensional, multi-dimensional mapping of them. And the theory is that there's going to be big blobs of numbers that form one, and there will be another blob over here, and if there's no overlaps, then that means you're looking at two separate kinds. That's the theory. Well, anything that starts getting in the overlappy department, uh, looking like a monobaramin, and it links up stuff. Um, what I suspect is that when they parse the data down, limit like MAD, which they, a, a baromenologist have a tendency to do, 
uh, they can accidentally parse themselves down to the point where they get an artifact like that, where Australopithecus sabida. I mean, it's not even in our genus. It's, you know, if, if you were, if you were, I could see them, you know, having a quibble about Homo erectus. And by the way, mm -hmm. the creations do have a terrible problem figuring out whether Homo erectus is, is in, in our totally family. A for totally human. <laughs> there's, there's, it's all over the map. You find a little bit of this with, Austral with uh, Archaeopteryx. Uh, that most creationists and intelligent designers will say Archaeopteryx is a bird. Yeah. Uh, but pandas and people classified as an erectile. <laughs> that just happens to have feathers, you know. <laughs> well, so you get a, uh, a, a weird exception to the rule on it. But, of course, it, it's a transitional. That's why you would have trouble deciding which one it is. Pandas and people was the sea design pro, uh, propenensists book, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, the Seed Design Propentius book. The uh, I've only I have the '93 version, which is the one where it's now knee deep in intelligent design. Steve Meyer contributed a subtitle chapter to it. Michael B. He was their uh, technical advisor on the uh, blood clotting sequence and all that. By that time, <laughs> what I, yeah. I don't have yeah. is um, the, the 1989 version, which I would really like to get at some point. And if I ever do an illustrated second edition for Slam Dunk, I really have got to settle the point because. There's a quibbly little fiddly bit about animal transition where a pandas and people says the same head up their ass stupid thing that Philip Johnson does. And that is that Morgan Ukadon, this particular early mammal, was mm -hmm. actually uh, uh, older than its supposed ancestors, according to this article Hobson wrote, uh, the paleo uh, mammal paleontologist for the American biology teacher. Well, I've seen the article. And it says no such thing. And so the odds of two people independently coming up with the same cockamamie wrong statement about Morgadukadon and the Hobson article is relatively remote. So yeah. it's either Hobson article is getting put in the claim in Johnson in 1991 in Darwin on trial, and then pandas and people co opts it when they do the 93 version. Mm -hmm. If I could see the 89 version to see what was in there, if they had that first, and the time frame makes me suspect that that was, because it's only a couple of years after the Hobson article in 87, I'm suspecting that they made the mistake first. Philip Johnson credulously repeated it parasitically, and then pandas and people then mm -hmm. repeated the mistake when they did the revision in 93, and Dembski and Wells repeated it when they did their 2007 retread for intelligent design uh and none of them ever bothered to check <laughs> well does wells ever fact check anything i mean no for uh, in sakes. fact i know uh, that he's a slim scholar um he'll splice stuff together for apologetic purposes when i checked up his footnotes uh from icons of evolution uh or his uh, background notes on uh, bird evolution there was a one where i finally found the book uh, I think Colbert uh, and Morales, uh, 1992's uh, uh, mammal uh, book. And the, the Eastern Library had it out there, so I could just go out to the stacks and, and check it. I couldn't check it out because I'm not a student there anymore, but nonetheless, I could, I could read the text. Uh, nobody had checked it out. Uh, it was part of their, their reference stack. And um, up the page numbers involved, and what he had, the page numbers, there was a section on the theropod dinosaurs, and then he had the page numbers for the ornithischian dinosaurs, not the ornithines, the bird section. There was a whole section on birds hmm. and bird evolution in Colbert, but that wasn't the page numbers. He had given the page numbers for the bird hip dinosaurs, which have nothing to whatsoever to do with birds and were not oh. claimed to have been. So it's clear that this guy is not as closely researching as he claims to be. Uh, yeah, he's, he's not the worst offender in there. Richard Milton is the of sloppy scholarship. I just, uh, he's my poster child for scholarly incompetence. And most people haven't heard of him because he's a relatively minor player, but he's a non religious young earth creationist. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like those are like married bachelors. Uh. Well, not when you read uh, uh, um, Parasitical uh, uh, Milton. Boy, that guy is a parasite and a half. I mean, copy material credulously of material from other writers and and think that he's done that research himself and never bothered to fact check any of it for somebody who got into mensa and was the editor of british mensa magazine that sure is a surefire indicator that mensa it doesn't count for much but then again the guy 
uh, the founded Mensa was a believer in the occult tarot, so uh, I'm afraid the, the ability to do these rotation puzzles crap uh, is no indication of true intelligence. Yeah, the um, well, it's like uh, uh, Stephen Meyer, I think, claims to be agnostic, which is hilarious, uh, isn't it? That's a new one, yeah. Uh, Michael like, Denton, no, Michael Denton, he's I thought the it one was... that just definitely claims to be agnostic. Yeah, Steve I Meyer, was... I think, is, is uh, out. He's, I, he's a Christian. Let me see. Stephen. Yeah. Exactly which denomination he is. Uh, I know Dembski uh, is a uh, Baptist and uh, Philip Johnson is Presbyterian. Um, and, but uh, no, as far as I know, Steve Meyer is not an agnostic. Michael okay. Denton. How maybe, it, maybe it must have been Michael Plains. Denton, which is okay. So, so Michael Denton, it's, it's so bizarre to think that these guys who work for creationists or intelligent design movements could somehow not believe in the entity that that they think created everything i don't get it you need to read denton's stuff it doesn't surprise me at all he's got this vague weird fog bank of these kind of types typology uh, that he was pushing uh, have you read uh, either one of michael denton's books he was written uh, for my no i've read um I've read a few, I've read a very few uh, apologetics books. I've got like uh, what is it? The uh, evidence that demands a verdict. Did man get here by evolution oh, or by creation? Mm. Which is now, uh, my, uh, yeah, is in a whole different character. But, but Denton is very influential. But uh, I first bumped into it. Um, evolution, a theory. In, I, I actually sh prefer to say it this way: evolution, a theory. I wanted to trill my R there. A theory in crisis. There we go. Nice. Um, that he, an Australian biochemist uh, wrote this in 1985. It it helped jumpstart the design movement. Uh, Michael Behe and Philip Johnson. There was a whole bunch of people that, that became the core of the design movement who were just really wowed because here was a sciency argument written by a non-religious person who is claiming that neo-Darwinism could not account for things and that the old pre-evolutionary typology of Richard Owen was actually correct and all of that. So it was terribly influential. And it was chock-a-block with references and sources and all of that. Now, uh, I was just starting to get into the source methods game at that time, but I did uh, spot the fact that uh, he's not a paleontologist and he didn't read a hell of a lot of paleontology. He left whole swaths of data off the floor. There would be no, there's no real discussion of the reptile mammal transition. He just kind of harumphed at it. He doesn't discuss dinosaurs. There's a whole bunch of things that aren't on his scope. And that was in the 85. Uh, uh, sort of seemingly dropped uh, typology because it wasn't going anywhere. Uh, and his next book, uh, the, uh, oh, um, uh, yeah, I can't think of the name of it. It was 1998. Um, was essentially on uh, kind of gee whiz, how fabulously complicated biology is. And then, however, questioned the typology, and he came back out of the closet um, uh, in the early uh, part of this decade and did his new book, Evolution: Still a Theory in Crisis, uh, <laughs> from 2016. And at that time, I was knee deep in working on the slam dunk, and I um, uh, asked uh, Glenn Branch at the NCSE, "Do uh, you have like a copy of that book I could borrow briefly?" And they they, they hadn't bought it, planning on buying it, but uh, he talked them into picking the book up, and they shipped it to me, and I got all my information out of it, and then shipped it to the NCSE. So the copy of Denton's book, which isn't all that big, it, it's it's a kind of a large paperback. Uh, anyway. Uh, he mentions the reptile mammal transition and a lot of other stuff. Well, I'm how hitting the subject at a full methods level at this stage. So I went through and I cataloged all of the technical sources cited, which is not a huge number. And the advantage is that almost all of it's available open access now. So that's really nice. And so I obviously was going to discuss his reptile mammal transition section. Uh, and then I also thought that th because that wasn't one of his heavy guns, feather evolution was, I felt I needed to deal with that. Plus, there's an awful lot of overlap between the placode formation of hairs and feathers and the same genes, bone morphological protein and all that, sonic mm -hmm. hedgehog, uh, apply in both tie in there. And uh, then I also went in 
I wanted to mention um, transitional fossils. And the one that I noticed that he never mentioned back in the 85 book was Fika Mirma, which is the predicted wasp ant that E.O. Wilson had predicted, they're, they're, they're his bunch. And uh, so I was curious, did he mention it in the new book? Uh, no, but worse, he managed to step around it, not once, not twice, but in three of his own cited sources on ants, including Jerry Coyne, who explicitly pointed out that it was a predicted fossil. And somehow or other, it never made it onto his scope to mention it to his readers. Uh, instead, he had this long, well, not that long, about, you know, a, a, it's a chunky paragraph, but it was basically how ants are apparently a fixed type mentions all the, the metaplural glands and the various connections and things that are the diagnostic features of ants and they they do not vary from one ant to another. And uh, so I looked up the sources he was citing and a bunch of other material and pulled apart because it never occurred to him, reader, what any of this jargon meant. He was just going, wow, you know, metaplural glands. Well, what the hell is a metaplural gland? So I did a whole bunch of research on that. And I learned way more about ants than I knew and found out, no, ants are way more interesting than Denton was making out. They've shown enormous variation over time. They're still ant-like in the same way we're primate-like. But, but viva la difference. Uh, you know, you've got ant, these, uh, these metaplural glands, uh, they still don't know what any of them do, literally. Species of ants and only a handful have been explored there. If you think how big an ant is and try to look at the back end of the ant, teeny tiny little gland that squirts something on the back end of the back end about what exactly it does and you're going to have to do genotyping and you're going to have to worry and see it in ecological context it's not easy well and the so the well, myrmecologists are just scratching the surface they're just starting to analyze what these damn metaplural glands do uh yeah i think uh, ants are really neat because you've got um ants like uh uh, formica, formica subfuda, which ha, which which don't use like the slave ants, for instance. But then you've got, on the other hand, mm -hmm. uh, a polygerus uh, brevis, breviceps, which like makes use of uh, a huge like army of of slaves. You know, so there's I can tell Buckaroo I. I bow to you for the ability to rattle off not only the genus name, but the species name, because I rarely ever remember that second uh, the derivation. You're, you're a better man than I, Gunga Dan. Oh, I got a secret, it's a secret project that I've told you about. Um, that's where I got it. But <laughs> uh, but anyways, the um, it would, uh, in Darwin's own day, he made note in Origin of Species about the usages of of uh, uh, slavery in ant colonies. It was in the same chapter he talked about honeycombs oh, yeah. with, with bees. The creationists and, uh, make a big deal out of it because they say he's he's giving an evolutionary defense of slavery. Yeah, not really. No. No, that was not the point. That was not even vaguely the point of the art of the, the chapter. The whole chapter was called instincts and he's explaining how yeah. these instincts could have arisen like bee comb or uh, yeah, honeycombs and bees or slavery in ants, or metamorphosis in, in caterpillars, which was a really interesting chapter because it was very mathematical, very detailed on the honeycombs. He was explaining all this, yeah. like the, the angles and stuff of the honeycombs and whatnot and how deeply they burrowed and all Insects that. Insects were, were utterly fascinating because of the, the, uh, the hive quality, the social insects, the fact that they have uh, uh, queens, and the, of course the wasps run similarly. The, the, the neat thing about Sphica myrmids is that they're at the very root of the split between wasps and ants. And in fact, the only thing that would classify them as an ant is that damn metaplural gland. Everything else about it was the predicted form of what a transitional ancestor would be between ants and wasps. And uh, we, we can't nail it down too much more because it's occurring way back in the Cretaceous and there are very few ant fossils other than the ones that pop up. I think something like 40 or 50 percent of all ant fossils are in amber. And they are much more recent in the Eocene and all that when you have plants that make goop and so oh, yeah. stray the land yeah, and, yeah, and get through. Yeah, the giant ants. I can't remember the genus name, but you got the giant ants in the Eocene that started <laughs> appearing, which is just so gross. <laughs> asks which ant was on the ark. Uh, yeah, generally speaking, the insects are not a subject that the creationists like to ponder. 
because there are so effing many of them that it's going to be really, really difficult yeah, for them to or, work this out. Or tardigrades. Uh, yeah, the, or, the, uh, the arthropods in general are ones that the baromenologists have been really slow to ponder, uh, if, although theoretically they'd need to do it. Favored from a side issue, and I think I referred to it in Dynamania. Everybody read Dynamania, damn it. It's, it's good shit. Um, is about uh, the Herodotus and the gold mining ants <laughs> that are in there, and and so when they were when they were trying to talk about how uh, Herodotus was somehow confirming something about some biblical thing about mm -hmm. uh, I think the uh, golden incense uh, uh, connections or some such minor thing, and I'm going, yeah, are we also to believe all the material about the gold mining ants? <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah, the it's there <laughs> seems to be very little in the way of of information on um i think protostomes in general mostly because because i mean nobody's interested in these invertebrates nobody cares about those they don't vote they don't sing the praises of the lord as a, as a, a ajs on the uh, side thing says creationists tend to ignore insects they don't breathe through their nostrils yeah they breathe through their skin that's the reason why you had giant insects during the carboniferous because oxygen levels were uber high they were about 50 percent and uh, it's another reason why you, you didn't have grass. <laughs> if it had evolved, uh, forest fires would be really intense. And in fact, there is a, a development that the, the proliferation of monocot grasses that occurs in the post-KT period is to some extent related to the fact that oxygen levels are much lower. And so spontaneous wildfires are less likely because there's less oxygen in the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. It was a... Uh... The Carboniferous is, is very interesting, but it also laid the foundation, or par partially laid the foundation for the the Permian Triassic extinction, trapping all the carbon, all the the carbon underground. But um, yeah, it was a, it is really interesting because, uh, as I've read about it and kind of learned that it's a, everything is a sort of domino. Uh, I mean, occasionally there are these little interesting bits that just sort of happen. They're just uh, what is it? Uh, Gould called them uh, contingencies of history. I think, like uh, yeah, Picard yeah, yeah, surviving the Burgess decimation, uh, lignin, the yeah, invention. We, we still, uh, it's still a hot debate subject as to how much is contingency and how much is natural process that's going to work out kind of that way. Anyway, I'll just jump in to say uh, AJS has a neat little question on that, which brings up the minor point: How did Noah build an aquarium capable of holding a pair of blue whales? Uh, uh, like insects, the swimmy things are not something that creationists like to think too much about because well, yeah. they have a simultaneous problem of preserving fish, freshwater fish, and preserving saltwater fish in a single giant global ocean that needs to be like one or the other or something in between, and whatever you pick is going to kill off something. It's so, kill uh, off like most fish, either way. I mean, honestly, yeah, it's, it's going it's to an insoluble be. Problem. It's going to decimate because I have, I have, uh, I love fish. I have lots of fish tanks, as you as you know, RJ. And fish oh, require no, a. I, I've only seen a portion oh. of your of your environment there, and usually it's kind of dark. So I I, I don't oh, really know the. Sorry, I, yeah. I I know I brought it before. That must have been to, to Peter. But um, I've got four fish tanks that I take care of. I've got uh, a cylindrical one, uh, with which has some. Uh, poecilia and a, a for a little poecilia and a ghost shrimp. And I've got one with a little f lone fiddler crab because he doesn't like neighbors. One with an <laughs> elephant fish and some some quarries in it. And then we've got one downstairs which has a, a cichlid and some an African dwarf frog and a few others. Um, but fish require a delicate balance yeah. of of temperature and saline levels. And so if if we're talking about all this flood water coming in, and of course the heat's going to, even if we ignore the problem of heat and pressure, um, you're going well, to kill you off. You get a lot of poached fish that way. I get a lot of what? <laughs> you get a lot of poached fish that way. Yeah, you're you're um, we lost the entire population of filefish off the coast of Japan in in 1988 because there was a. Uh, a rise in in the ambient ocean temperature. The entire population of file of orange spotted filefish off the coast of Japan in a single year, just the whole population uh, went extinct. And so, 
Um, and so the flood is going to kill off it, whichever, because I mean, it, it can't be salt water that's coming in because it's either from outer space or it's groundwater. I get, I don't really. Well, it's that fountain of the deep, you know, whatever that is. It's it's filled with magicum. The, the wonderful substance that can simultaneously be salty and not salty and hot and cold all at the same time that can uh, manage to uh, flash freeze mammoths and, uh, and parboil critters and uh, fry the flesh <laughs> off of them and turn everything into rock super fast. Yeah. Uh, it, it has a, an amazing set of properties. And, it's, and what makes it even more amazing is that it's burying Ediacaran fauna at the bottom and then Cambrian fauna, and then Silurian, and up and up and up, all the way to the top. Oh, it's worse. It's burying Ediacaran fauna, not at the bottom physically, because they're up kind of where you can see them in Australia. Yeah. Uh, there's older yeah, rocks the, underneath them. The strata's but, been exposed yeah, by erosion, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, one of the favorite stupid things I've ever heard was from Native American creationist uh, Vinny Deloria, Jr., uh, who just died, I think, a couple years ago. But anyway, he was a Velikovskian in that, too. So he connected up with, uh, I bumped into him way earlier, uh, a long story. But anyway, um, he said, all oh, these dinosaur things, they, that, if they can't be the way that uh, evolutionists and the regular geologists think. You know? Because how come that the only place you find dinosaurs is at uh, right in plain sight where you can dig them up? Ah. Because you know you kind of wait until Geology. they erode out. Who I needs? suppose if you wanted, we could excavate the entire planet meter by meter, and I think there would be some paleontologists who'd be happy with that. But I think if you suddenly started dismantling Penn Station in New York City to do an excavation underneath, you know somebody's going to get pissed off. <laughs> yeah, you start going through people's backyards. That's going to be a lot of royalties people are collecting. <laughs> That's, you know, I mean, you know, like. Uh, it, it, it's a relatively minor stupid mistake, but it tells you how completely clueless he was on the nature of geology. You get the same thing as why aren't there meteors, uh, meteorites preserved in the fossil record? Well, actually there are, but yeah. the, the object is that most of the time they're relatively rare. And when they mm -hmm. land on the surface, the odds are that they will get buried in something else. So how many are there in the entire landscape of Antarctica? Well, we can go and dig the whole place apart. Then we will know exactly. But it's not really, you have to wait until something erodes at the edge, and then you notice it. Well, yeah, the, um, I'm actually interested, since, since we're talking about meteorites, what are your thoughts on the, uh, the supposed meteorite that hit just a few, that, like, it was a giant meteorite that hit like a few thousand years ago? And oh, oh, the one that they, they argue about the Younger Dryas, yeah. Uh, that there is just a ping pong match that goes back and forth in PNAS to this day uh, on it. That there is some circumstantial evidence and some microtectites. Meanwhile, the skeptics bunch then write the counter papers, and it, oh, it's just been this has been going on for years. And uh, it, it, there's a little bit of it in science and nature, but most of the back and forth had been in proceedings in the National Academy of Sciences. And I, it, it wouldn't surprise me. But um, that there was a, a, um, a, uh, an event, but they're trying, the ones that are really kind of pushing it are arguing a bit too much for it because we have more than enough indication that the Younger Dryas is being triggered off by a change in drainage patterns down the St. Lawrence Seaway when water is being dumped in because of glacial melting. And uh, you've got, uh, you only need one big dump of fresh water from a, a, a draining lake. Uh, to short circuit the uh, thermoclines that produce the uh, ocean current distributions and, the, and it can drop the planet's temperature uh, abruptly and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, the Younger Dryas is a real phenomenon. I mentioned it in Dynomania, my chapter at DIP, because it relates to flood geology uh, issues and the issue of the uh, circumstances of the Black Sea flooding that are possibly some of the backstory for the biblical flood tale, or rather the Mesopotamian flood tales yeah. that got copied. As that one used to be that one used to be my uh, chief hypothesis as to how the flood uh, myth originated or legend, I guess. Uh, I tend to stick more now with the uh, the Zeusudra uh, dispersal story. Oh, well, most of it tale is the Babylonian one. But the question is, are there elements that predate it? And well, I have to say that the argument that was made, first of all, it's a really spectacular event 
And it did indeed occur that there was a, a change in drainage patterns where, the, where suddenly you had the thing where the Mediterranean started refilling faster than the Black Sea did. So the Black Sea had a, had a really low level and there were people living around it. I mean, uh, what's mm -hmm. his name? Uh, Ballard uh, did some uh, work in there where they were looking around for it. It's not an easy thing to investigate because it's at the bottom of an ocean and a lot of the nations quibble. The, the, the Turks don't like people running around in the Black Sea and a bunch of other things. Um, <laughs> but there are... There are elements that that suggest that a, a dim and distant memory is filtered into some of the lore that connected as some of the little fiddly bit details that ended up in the Mesopotamian things. Most of the Mesopotamian flood tales, however, are connected to real places and real circumstances because the damn Tigris and Euphrates flooded catastrophically a lot and he mm -hmm. washed their mud brick cities away repeatedly. So Shurpak and these various other uh, places uh, and the king names, Atrahasis and these various other ones pop up, um, are relating it much more to actual historical events in there. But the, the, the Black Sea event is so unusual in the same way an analogy is the Santorini eruption that is so spectacular, somebody must have noticed it, mm -hmm. here that it probably mm -hmm. has filtered into the lore in various ways. So I don't attribute the, um, uh, the Black Sea flooding as the flood, but it right. is an event mm -hmm. that put in some of the bits, for example, in the, and this is more true of the Babylonian tales than the uh, a biblical tale. There's a, a curious bit where um, there is a thing where um, one of the Babylonian tales refers to dropping a rock down uh, and dangling it from the boat. Well, that's a way that you can move around in the Black Sea because of the of the salinity in, the, uh, uh, in there that's so oddball because there's so huh. few rivers huh. coming in. And so there are little weird traditions that are still retained. And then the other bit is that a lot of the people, if they, if they fled south of the Black Sea, they would be running into what were known at the time as the mountains of Ararat. Be confused with Mount Ararat, which is a recent name that's applied to Agridagi, which is a mountain in Turkey that is not really the mountains of Ararat. So if you look at it in these larger contexts, you can even see how a lot of the, of the terminology gets channeled and telephone gamed over many, many centuries until finally you start getting the stuff that gets into the, the Bible lore, which they probably picked up during the Babylonian captivity along with the Tower of Babel story and the Genesis days of creation and all of that stuff, and then later on codified in their written texts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I all actually, that information um, in Daimlomania. It's I go into all the wonderful references on there. Uh, there's I, relatively I, new information, uh, relatively little new information other than the ping pong match over the Younger Dryas because I keep on uh, collecting any relevant information on that uh, ongoing flap. The romantic in me, would suggest that there might actually have been a, a, a small asteroid impact that caused a big splat that made one more thing going wrong. Because that, that's the whole bit you get into with the, the KT extinction, where the, the bulk of the problem was coming from the Deccan Traps volcanic eruptions in India, and the Chichalub thing was just one more bad thing thing over the scales oh, yeah. and caused the whole system to collapse. I think it's very interesting how they came across the remains of it. Like the oil. Oh, I think uh, it was oil. They, weren't they hunting around for oil yeah, deposits yeah. or something? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then they yeah. were like, oh, and, hey, and they realized what's it was this? this monster what's crater. This? Yeah. And it's interesting that the Chichalub impact crater is on the opposite end of the earth than the Reunion Island hotspot. And it looks like that there was a little bit. In fact, you, Ross, was blipping about it just a, a few days ago. And I go, yawn, this is old news. You please stick behind the curve here. Um, that uh, there was, a, a, in effect, a resonance aftershock that would then come together and go boop and cause a, a renewed activity there at the Deccan Traps uh, at the time India was on there. You find the same thing, I think with, there's a, a, a big Martian volcano or something that's at the opposite end of an old Martian um, impact crater uh, that, or, or, or something on the moon. I can't remember whether it was Mars or moon uh, that uh, can cause that same kind of thing uh, where there's a factor that pops up. Uh, these, these things, we don't normally think of solid rock ringing like a bell, but it does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see, we've gotten into geology. Oh, Paul, if you're referring to me as the really nice guy, yeah, I have a Patreon cloud. Everybody on in our, in our network uh, could use more Patreons. 
uh, if, you, if, if you find that any of us have fewer patrons than Jaronism Flat Earth, you need to say, what is wrong with this picture? Let's do something about it. <laughs> um, what else did I... Oh, that's right. Okay, something else uh, about the, the Genesis Apologetics video. Uh, we kind of touched on how they just fundamentally misunderstand how evolution works with the the living fossils earlier. They also got hung up on on uh, early members of different groups. Uh, for two of the groups, they uh, they mentioned three groups as not having transitional uh, members, and that's pterosaurs, dinosaurs, and bats. For um, yeah, the dinosaurs ain't true anymore. Uh, in fact, there are so many almosts in the dinosaur morphes uh, that are popping up there uh, that it's you know a, a, a surfeit. Uh, do you want to pick lagosuchids or any of the other little weird little bipedal critters that are running around the Triassic? Now, pterosaurs and bats. Again, I went into this in the old tip work into the Bermuda Triangle defense. For those of you who don't know, I did a little mini little video on it. I wanted a term to describe the tendency of creationists to say, oh, there is a fossil mystery. There are no transitionals uh, for X. Well, where would you go to find X and how easily would X be to preserve? And what you invariably find is the creationists and intelligent designers will do the same shtick. Um, will never, as in not ever, look at the geological context of maybe there's a reason why it's hard to find them. Uh, bats and pterosaurs are very small. The earliest pterosaurs are about the size of a crow. Early bats are small enough to hold in your hand. Uh, they have tiny bodies. They have very fragile bones. They have a very sparse fossil record. And also there's relatively few rocks available the farther you go back in time for pterosaurs in particular. Bats are tougher because they're so tiny. Uh, well, there are something like 24 bat families, and, and the vast majority of them don't have a fossil record at all, let alone going back to the... Yeah, for, um, for pterosaurs, I read some, I read some papers. Uh, it turns out Scleromachlis, a little uh, diapsid from the uh, Triassic, I think, has been pretty well established as a, a sort of pre-pterosaur. Hmm. I'll have to. Uh, there, I'll have to uh, look into that because that's. Uh, it could be just a recent uh, thing. The cladistics may have helped a bit on there. How do you spell that? Uh, S C L E R O M O C H L U S. Ooh. Okay. One of those. Scleromachlis. Oh, that's so sweet. Let me see Let's if see. I've got him in my little bibliography here. It probably, uh, sometimes taxa names will not show up in the actual title of something. Uh, let's see where we are here. Blah, 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 And nothing. So I'll have to, uh, so it's I'll have a, to look up the uh, technical thing. Um, They'd be Nez relatively small critters. There's this a particular couple weird little bones. I think the pterygoid bone or something like that. That's a little fil filigree that comes off of uh, the wrist. That's uh, a tricky little anatomical feature uh, that relates to it. Uh, it's presuming that they would be some kind of little glider thing, and I would expect them to be quadrupedal because, like bats, um, they are as quadrupedal as all get out. But yeah. you have relatively few deposits to look in. The Triassic doesn't have a staggering amount of deposits to work with. Some, you can get some fields like the Ishigolach Stowe down in Argentina, of where you've got a lot of early dinosaurs and a lot of therapsids and other things pop up in there. Uh, but pterosaurs, almost all the early pterosaur fossils are found in lakes or riverine settings where they've apparently come flat down to eat something and miscalculated and ended up dead and then preserved. And so if you don't have that kind of a deposit area, and some of those would be environments that would be scrunched and covered over and compacted and rearranged and obliterated by uh, geology and, uh, and glaciation and all that in the, what, 200 million years since, like nothing's happened. Uh, yeah. But the Bermuda, the Bermuda Triangle defense issue is that creationists literally never bother to look at that. 
And I call it the Bermuda Triangle defense because it's the same class of logic. Oh, the mysterious ship disappearance of September such and so. And it doesn't occur to you to check whether like the worst hurricane in 20 years went through the area on the night of the mysterious ship disappearance. You think it might have had something to do with the mysterious ship disappearance? So if you don't look at those contexts, you are, are deck stacking. And then, of course, what would the transition look like? Uh, do they ever think about what a transition would look like? And so if one came up and bit him on the knee, would they uh, accept it as such? They don't do that either. No, the, um, well, uh, Pegasoferi as a clade is, they're, they're pretty much like no transitional fossils for that whole group. I mean, once you, what you find of those is like we find the first, we find like the, the earliest bat is, uh, it's like a Onychonipterus or something like that. Uh, Onychonipterus, sorry. Although I think the, the earliest bat, one thing that is is the earliest bats that they do have the fossils for apparently couldn't echolocate. Yeah, that's, that, that was... There's a transitional feature there. They're still flyers, they're still bats, but they're not echolocating, so that's a derived feature that comes along later on. Now, the, the, the gene people are insisting that it looks like bats, uh, when you look at all the different gene types from the various families, they're projecting that the bats are developing from some critter to extinction. Mm -hmm. And all the fossils we know are well after that, down in the 55 million years, so 5 or 10 million years after the KT extinction. Uh, the romantic in me wants to have the interesting idea that bats indeed uh, were developing before the KT extinction. And this, the reason why this is interesting well, yeah. is that mm -hmm. this would be telling us stuff about ecological relationship. Because one thing that is very interesting about bats is bats and birds are in different niches. Birds are the rulers of the air and had become the rulers of the air. You find the pterosaurs uh, weren't driven co to complete extinction by birds, but uh, on their own. Uh, but they were pushed into new niches that the uh, old Triassic era Ramphorinchids uh, are little itty bitty uh, flyers and they're crow size and they're quite small. When you f especially find birds coming onto the field in the Jurassic and then the Cretaceous, they're beginning to dominate the aerial environment, except in an area where pterosaurs are able to adapt relatively easy, which is giant gliders, uh, quetzalcoatlus and all that kind of stuff. There's no bird on earth at that time, or even today, that gets anywhere near that. The closest you get to is something like a condor, and I think there was an extinct um, uh, uh, a condor that was even bigger than the condor condor, uh, one to, but not, nothing like the, the, the Cessna-sized uh, Quetzalcoatlus and that, these monster uh, pterosaurs. And, and so there's, um, they were able to compete in a niche that they weren't competing with birds. Well, likewise, bats seem highly likely that they're developing in a nocturnal environment, a niche mm -hmm. that birds as a rule didn't deal with until relatively recently with things like owls and that that are able to live in a nocturnal environment. Basically, if the birds are there in the daytime, you ain't going to have any daytime flying bats. Uh, the, the, the bats will be the ones who they'll come out at night and they'll go after that kind of thing and pollinate tequila taxes and all that kind of stuff. So anybody who likes tequila had better like bats uh, because uh, they're part of the food chain there. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I personally would be delighted if it were the case that the fossil genie might show some example of a proto-bat. But the odds of finding the fossils, given the, the, the vagaries of the fossil record and how tiny the bones are and how difficult it is to preserve them, that's true of most mammals. Most fossil mammal species tend to be known only by their teeth. Mm -hmm. You might only find an animal from that thing. It, uh, it would be something rodent-like uh, from a bat fossil if all you've got is the teeth. And the reason why it's the teeth is because they're damn durable. The rest of the stuff disintegrates too easily. Uh, there are some, if you live in the wrong environment, there's virtually no fossil record for chimpanzees because they live in a place that just disintegrates bones. Oh, so yeah. It, yeah. yeah. So that you're not going to expect to find them there. So um, these are the canards. It's not only the, the pterosaurs and um, uh, bats that would have this suffer problem, but also the various critters that were being found during the Triassic in the marine realm. And here's, however, where the fossil genie has been rather pliable because we now know much more about the early evolution of turtles we, and the uh, terrace, or, uh, 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 ichthyosaurs and the uh, uh, plesiosaur bunch. They've now got more information on the transitional features there in spite of the fact that th that's occurring in marine deposits of the Triassic that are so bloody rare, but 
little snippets there, the fossil genie comes through. So um, we can guarantee that if the fossil genie does bring in a transitional form for a bat or a pterosaur, they'll just reject it. And they'll say, well, no, this is something completely different. And they'll do the same song and dance they do on Archaeopteryx because there can never be a transitional form in principle. And they will find some way to maneuver around it. Yeah, like in uh, in Richard Dawkins' book, The Greatest Show on Earth, there was uh, how he said, if anyone has a right to complain about missing links, it's the chimpanzees, not us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, The um, uh, it, it's a delicious thing that... So many of the debates that are repeated by creationists who don't read modern creationism, let alone the science, are kind of dead letter ones. Because we've got so much more fossil data than we used to. So the old um, uh, single species notion about human origins is just out the window. We have the thicket of hominids and bipedalism, which was a big hot debate. Did big brains occur first or bipedalism? This was fighting words. It's one of the reasons why the Piltdown hoax was constructed. It had a big brain, but otherwise ape-like, uh, fake. Uh, and plus it was in England, which of course, as English being superior people, we really want to have some hominids in our country too, not all of this Africa stuff. Mm. Uh, so uh, that, that's reason. kind of where I came out. I went into a lot of that in, in Planet of the Apes at, at uh, TIP, where I went into a lot of the history of this. But anyway, um, we were already settling the thing that with us with the australopithecines we were seeing that bipedalism was developing before big brains and now with the discovery of the, of the thicket of hominins that are knocking around in there bipedalism is really a fairly common adaptation in their clade and group and the, even though not all of them ended up doing the kind of shtick that eventually led to the australopithecines bipedalism is a a pretty common bit and that means that the kind of genetic mutations that can produce that are probably way more common and therefore you can retro engineer in terms of human anatomy and primate anatomy to look at what target genes are involved to work out the actual paleogenomics of it and believe you me eventually they will they're not gonna stop <laughs> yeah 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 paleogenomics and that well that and uh Evo Devo really seem to be cutting edge right mm -hmm. now with figuring out the evolutionary history because you can uh, of organisms because you can only get so far with I mean you can get pretty far with fossils and uh, morphological similarities and genetics but only so far all we can see for a lot of them are the adult forms of these things but what's happening at the embryonic stage what is changing on the molecular level which is resulting in you know, an axial twist or a uh, yeah. or or a, a, a gene flip or something like that. You know. Well, really, if you look at the cutting edge of Evo Devo, they are actually integrating all the layers. Uh, for some of the, for example, I mentioned it in Slam Dunk, the fact that there was an issue about the the, the vertebral structure of mammals, and uh, there are particular forms of why the vertebrae develop in certain um, cervical vertebrae, but not in others. Well, they've got living mammals that they can tinker with. So they went in and now they know enough about the genetics and the regulation of the genetics to find out the point mutation that flips on and off um, uh, uh, bones that we see in the ancestral forms, but not in the modern versions. And you can recreate them boop, just by that point mutation flipping of that particular gene now that they know how the system works. And so uh, they're getting more and more of that because you, you've got basically the test lab of what actually happened. It's only a potential part of all the things that might have happened, but whenever you've got forms that are still alive to, where you've got the genes to look at, you can start piecing together what the genetic structures were in the same way they've worked out the bit of the, uh, of the archosaur, uh, dinosaur snout, that the little front bone that turns into the bird beak mm. off some of the genes and pull back to the pre the dinosaur version of it to show how the one thing flipped into the other and hey. uh, they keep on discovering new pieces of, of the puzzle so th this shows yeah. you that the idea that evolution isn't experimental and it's not observational was something you might say in 1960 but not in 2017 because you're getting to the point where you can retro engineer stuff well, I've actually read uh, creationist stuff on the retro engineering, and they're saying stuff like they are growing, they're making the birds go down these paths 
It's like, wait, what? We're forcing them to have? Oh yeah, yeah. That it's supposedly a, a matter of the, their uh, the the stuff that Elizabeth Mitchell. I went into this in in Slam Dunk uh, because I was fascinated. It was kind of a test case of how you could see that intelligent designers and young earth creationists were approaching this little matter of this retro engineering bird beak things exactly the same way. That there was no difference between how they were snarking, except the creationists tended to be a little snottier about it because they would be going on that these these are deformed birds that are being artificially manipulated and they wouldn't ever right. be able to survive in the wild. You know, I mean, they were just exactly. going ballistic. Oh, yeah, uh, Juby. Ian Juby was saying that about... Uh the nylon bacteria and the E. coli back in the day. Mm. Back when he was <laughs> yes, doing yes, stuff. And he is a nitwit, so uh, he's always a fun one. He's a small-scale fellow, although there are a tiny little coterie of, of dubiousists that you pop up with every once in a while. He, uh, he pops up um, uh, with a small number of acolytes. I think he's a dentist, if memory serves me. Wouldn't but be surprised I, I could be wrong on that. slightly. I mean, electrical engineers and, and mathematicians, there's a certain kind of, of trope that you pop up, and lawyers uh, in anti evolutionism that uh, uh, is an interesting phenomenon to look at. And biochemists, you tend to get biochemists. Yeah, that's uh, true. You do get biochemists. Uh, it's oh, Wayne Gish was a biochemist, and of course, Michael Behe and Michael Denton, uh, all in that biochemist, which means they're, they're familiar with the biology, kind of, but at a distance, because they're not really dealing with it in the nuts and boltsy area that you would if you were a microbiologist or some of these others there it's harder to do that you can be yeah that was that I'm was told. actually a, yeah going yeah that was actually a, a question um uh, i think that was you who asked uh, uh dr myers uh like why is it these guys like purdom who should darn well know what she's saying is wrong why is she doing this and myers was saying well, you know, you take the classes, but when you're in the PhD work, you are in this sliver of a field and you don't really have to bop into anything else. It's just your work. And then you get your PhD and you move along. And so it's just, it's really, it's really odd to think about because they, they know, because it's what we talked about. They know the answers to the questions on for the tests and then they're just flushing it down the drain thereafter remember they can compartmentalize structure that uh, although uh, anti-evolutionists will insist that they pay attention to the same data set they are just not blinded by materialism and all of that that the uh, nasty darwinians are um when you look at what information they actually pay attention to there's a certain tunnel vision to the way they look at anything. There's a, uh, I, one of the things I call gee whiz, which is, ooh, gee, how complicated X is. And they'll, they'll tend to do that as that glee club mentality. Uh, then if you look at, uh, you'll notice how few of them deal with paleontology and how few of them are paleontologists, because this is just, just a, uh, oh, how much longer do you want to continue this video? Uh, it's all entirely up to you, Jackson, because we have been rattling on for quite a while, although we still got 10 viewers, and uh, any, everybody can weigh in as to whether or not we're boring them to death or not, uh, because, uh, <laughs> you know, I can talk indefinitely. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was just wondering, because uh, I got... It's late where you are. You, it's it's uh, 11 o'clock now there in, yeah, in uh, Louisiana. I also, I also have work. And so I was just... You have a life. You have a life, unlike me, as as a dedicated nitwit scholar here in Spokane. Well, life is, uh, life is relative. I stack meat, and I am a cashier, so that's a lot of mindless labor. I have done many things of that. Yes, I've, I've uh, sawn wood and built sheds and uh, uh, tarp trucks. And uh, In fact, one of the weirdest things, when I was having an exchange with David Berlinski one time, I happened to mention that um, I, I drove a forklift at one point and he didn't know what that was and i'm not sure he knew what that was even after i explained it to him which gives you some idea what in a feet little world he lives in there uh, slouching on his brincusi chair in his paris apartment uh in uh, um uh, expelled <laughs> hey, christine uh, christina's right you are never boring james very true <laughs>
I try not to be. I, I have a broad ranging interest. I really do love it when we get interesting questions and comments uh, in, in the uh, uh, chat window and or when people that pop up into the room in videos. And I, I enjoy fielding off as much as I can talk indefinitely. I think it's also valuable to get the interaction because then it puts us into a different perspective and, and pushes us into more interesting areas than it would just be if I'm just the talking head. <laughs> uh, Paul Skeptic says he has to be up in about five hours. So we should probably, we're just a little after nine o'clock here since I'm the commander of the broadcast. Uh, we'll put it, does anybody have any last minute comments or questions or things to say uh, in the peanut gallery there? Uh, that we can respond to or discuss or, or potentially just topics listen. for future. <laughs> yeah, suggest us topics for future discussions. Yeah, anybody can do that, um, not only by tweeting uh, or those who have my email or anywhere on that venue. Uh, and remember, hashtag tip, my damn website. Uh, yeah. You can go in there. There's those chat windows, uh, tabs, any of those. Anybody can come in there and say, hey, there's an interesting subject that you guys could discuss. Or if you have a question, Jackson himself knows how easy it is to pick my brain. Tell me what happened What happened uh, just uh, yesterday. Oh, uh, or day before yes. Yesterday. R RJ, you, you are the god of sources. <laughs> you are literally creating sources at will with your mind it's amazing okay what what i did folks was i was watching yeah i was watching the genesis uh, the genesis apologetics uh video and one of the things they they uh brought up was a paper titled of uh, fossil bird shakes up evolutionary hypotheses i believe is the name of it and they mention a a crow sized bird, like a fully fully formed bird that was around like fifty million years, I think, before Archaeopteryx. And so I uh I looked up I wanted to look up the, the paper to see if this was true because it sounded really far fetched considering everything we know about bird evolution. And so uh I couldn't get to the the it, the articles in nature but it wouldn't let me get to it without paying yeah, it, was, it was a commentary by beardsley in 1986 which is yeah. way back to begin with it's older yeah, than it you a, are yes this is a very old old paper um and so i asked so i asked you i said hey i need your help can you tell me about this paper and you said oh they're referring to a a fossil or a skeleton that's not even an actual animal it's like a yeah a, a compilation habits. or a combination of 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 fossils. So that was that was amazing. It was awesome. I was so yeah, impressed yeah, because I just went. I, I, it took me actually. It took me a few minutes to remember it, and I then started doing a little bit of searchings around, and then I realized, oh shit, it's in three macroevolutionary episodes. I'd already covered that. That's the that's the stupid protoavis case. And yeah. uh, so uh, and I, I, if anybody wants to read about that, they can go to tip and look up three macro evolutionary episodes and or the uh, uh, bird section in um, uh, uh, cause the or, uh, yipes uh, uh, dem bones chapter old chapter two because if I, I go into it in both of those uh, three macro evolutionary episodes has picatures so that's a little bit nicer on that but it was an example of a supposed full blown bird that predated Archaeopteryx because it was a Triassic. And the problem was <laughs> it's not in lithographic limestone like Archaeopteryx. It was in the Dockham Formation in Texas, which is basically mud muck. And it's bits and pieces of stuff that was notoriously difficult for things. And it's highly ironic that the, it's probably the bits and pieces of a Herrerasaur and maybe something else that he put together as this thing that is sort of bird-like Never been but, I mean, effectively uh, taxonomized. It's never been accepted as a fossil. Alan Fiducia to this day says, "Yeah, just leave it aside." And but so I mean, it's. I think you, but not, RJ, not right. you, you blew my mind even more. You didn't just identify the paper and the fossil. You identified where <laughs> they got their source from. Another creationist. It was a. It was Gish. It had to be either from Dwayne Gish or somebody who copies Dwayne Gish because this one I've been tracking down and I discuss it in three macroevolutionary episodes and uh, and the uh, uh, Dem Bones chapter because it's so interesting. Uh, Gish 
hand on this Proto Avis case. And uh, a bunch of people since then, uh, Scott Hughes and Hank Hennegraff and others, uh, the Bible Answer Man guy, um, a relatively limited number of people, but they would come in and they would copy the Dwayne Gish material and repeat it in their books. And in the case of Hank Hanegraaff, I knew exactly where he copied it from because he copied the same typographical mistake that Gish had made. So there was no doubt whatsoever where he got this from. But it, it's a relatively minor blip. It doesn't pop up in every creationist lore. And it, 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 if you look up proto Avis and look at creationists, it's such a narrow field that Whatever they were doing at Genesis Apologetics, they were relying on Gish or somebody who relied on Gish. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> oh, yeah. They're using, I mean, they're, they, they were obviously quote mining Darwin from some other creationist source. They were quote mining uh, a letter from a paleontologist whose name I can't remember. He wrote a, Patterson, Patterson, yeah. They, it was like Patterson wrote a letter <laughs> to a creationist. But they didn't read the yeah. book, and I found I sent the I put in the my rebuttal a link to the talk origins page where it explains that whole thing and even gives a quote from the book talking about mm. Hierakotherium and Ichthyostega and Archaeopteryx. I got a whole section on the Patterson case uh, because it relates to cladistics and the problem that a lot of uh, anti-evolutionists, including Michael Denton had getting their head wrapped around Cladism, which Colin Patterson was at the very core, not merely of Cladism, but a particularly rigid form of Cladism. And poor Colin Patterson was in this schizoid mode as a hyper-gradualist, super Richard Dawkinsy type, at the same time that Cladism as a, a discipline as he was practicing is called ref, uh, reform or pattern Cladism. Um, basically doesn't ever allow you to identify ancestor-descendant relationships. It's only sister taxa, and there's a whole bunch of other things. And in some respects, bits and pieces of that took hold in the regular systematics department, but not the rigid version that Patterson advocated. So Patterson was having trouble the paleontology data that he didn't really want to study a heck of a lot outside of his particular niche and this form of cladism that was overly rigid and in some respects not very useful. Christine Janis, the mammal paleontologist, when we were talking because she had read my book and, and praised it and bought it and all of that, uh, she said she had some stories to tell about uh, her re uh, relationships with uh, Patterson and how uh, in many respects she was kind of a fuddlehead on things. And I had said, yep, I kind of determined that as well because I went through in Slam Dunk his analyses of these transitional issues and how he was constantly sticking his foot in his mouth. And he, even after he knew he had a propensity to do that, he would just go in again and give another damned interview with a creationist. And it, you know, it would occur to him that, that he really should not do that because that was not his forte, because he would be talking one subject and the other person was talking in a different frame where they're looking for ammunition, just be handing it out. But uh, as I pointed out that, that uh, Patterson, from our standpoints, if he's saying about how you can't find uh, transitional uh, features of, that, of the type he was talking about, um, excuse me, but you acknowledge that there are. So you're really talking across purposes with yourself, Patterson, and, uh, and just, just give it a rest. His last book, in fact, what was really ironic about it, came out just uh, after he died, because I think he died in 98 or 99, and the book came out in 99, the, the revised version of his uh, book on evolution. Not only did he still not mention things like the reptile mammal transition, but he didn't even mention Cladism, his own little, little area of discipline, because by the 1990s, everybody in paleontology was using Cladistic analysis, but it's not the version he was using. So he right. was kind of siding the poor bits on the siding. And so I, I, he's a, a quirky, oddball character. But the fact that your creationists were still trotting him out as an authority quote is not at all surprising because you're uh, the, the bunch that we're looking at there. And I'm going to test that out if I can get around to the time of looking through their website. I'm predicting that they will basically be channeling 1990s creationism. And it'll all be in that Dwayne Gish era. Well, hang in for that point of view. All that's going to stick in place. Yeah, I mean, I, I imagine so, but I think they're also channeling 1700s creationism in saying that all we uh, saying that paleontologists think that all organisms were killed by a uh, by floods. They were like all laid down by water. 
which is just <laughs> absolutely absurd. Oh, well, yeah, that Plutonism uh, versus, um, uh, or Neptunism versus um, uh, the, the other version, one either, either by fire or by water. And it was the stuff that was occurring in uh, the geology of about 1700 uh, that kind of got settled out when you had the new branch that was coming along. Oh, uh, so BJ Price has got a thing. Next time you guys are on Jackson Wheaton and I tweeted, I'll tag Trey into the notification. Fingers crossed. Yeah, well, with this was sort of an impromptu thing because we had started discussing this yesterday and uh, uh, Jackson's camera had a malfunction and so we uh, had to oh. abort. Yeah, it was the well. The first and, thing uh, I did was I hit the the end disc or stop broadcast button by accident because when I click on my uh on the bottom of the screen when the little screen comes up and I clicked on it, I accidentally like, double clicked I guess and so I hit it yeah. and then hit the stop and then the second time the internet went out like a few minutes into our second one. Yeah. So, so it, it's uh, anyway, I, I definitely wanted to discuss this subject because I think it was an extremely interesting one. And oh, yeah, uh, I'll probably end with just observation that if you want to find perfectly fine reasons not to believe in the flood, you know, you don't need to go any farther than looking down at your feet. Because <laughs> in principle, uh, the global floods got to be everywhere. So if you can't explain your backyard and the stuff that you can see from your backyard, your local geology convincingly with the flood geology, don't think that you can drag the damn Grand Canyon in on it. It's not oh, going to help your case. It just creates a wealth of, of more problem. <laughs> yeah. The two fundamental issues that every young earth creationist all the way up the food chain to Andrew Snelling have never been able to tell, and I've been looking around for a paper to explain it, is how the hell does the muck turn into rock so fast? Nope. Offer the slightest explanation, simply saying, well, there were weird conditions and heat. But you know, you don't you can't just bake a rock in a hurry, in the same sense that you can't just speed up the microwave on the cake and do it or the oven and expect to be able to do the cake in 10 seconds if you just up the ante. It same won't work oil. because some processes time yeah oil is another example the oil of course being a hilarious case because there was one bunch of creationists that thought to actually try to use flood geology to predict where an oil deposit was going to be and they went bankrupt uh, because they got it wrong and the uh, and it's no coincidence that somebody like a Steve Meyer is not a young earth creationist because he worked in the oil industry before becoming an intelligent design guru and um, he, he knows that no geologist on earth uses flood geology to predict where oil deposits are. It just doesn't make any sense because oil is occurring in basically microorganisms that are existing in, in ocean beds, uh, whereas coal deposits are occurring in uh, old uh, plant deposits and stuff and don't occur now because a, a white fungi got into an endosymbiotic relationship with bacteria and basically devour plants and trees really fast now. So you can't have that anymore. But oil deposits are very, very specific. And also things of why diamonds are found in certain areas, why certain kinds of uh, crystals and jewels are found in certain deposits and, and things. They, they, there are gradients of, of the formation of the crystals that um, are extremely precise. And in order to have a flood geology model, you've got to explain everything, not just the Lewis overthrust or, or bits and pieces of the Grand Canyon. Oh, and the, yeah. in, the Grand Canyon, canyon, the rock first, because there's fossil deposits going quite a ways down. They, they can theoretically squeak around the Precambrian part. But by the time you get up to the Cambrian deposits, up in the, uh, it goes well up to the Cretaceous on the top area. And I think there's Jurassic on the north rim. Um, that um, all of that has to be formed in one big go and turn into rock fast enough that it will second flood that sloshes downstream like the Missoula flood and carves the canyon in a way that water moving that fast would not do. Exactly. Yeah. It wouldn't the, form that canyon. Everything about it just can't make sense. Yeah. The, and I've never yeah. seen Snelling or or Steve Austin or anybody else develop in detail any experiments they've ever tried to do or material to accommodate both the rock formation part and the detail of the canyon formation and, and trying to drag Mount St. Helens into it. Um, it, it doesn't work because it actually is, yes, you can get a mini Grand Canyon from water coming downstream, but it won't last very long because it's not in rock. It's in muck. 
and you can make a little mini Grand Canyon in a dirt excavation in your house with a garden hose, but it ain't going to stay there and it's not going to form V-shaped nested canyons, which is occurring only, as we've known hydrologically for an awful long time, it only will occur when the headwaters versus the outlet changes faster than the water can erode. And if it does, then you form the incised canyon. And you found, did that with the Grand Canyon because the, uh, Columbia, uh, the Colorado uplift was taking place faster than the outlet. Uh, it was basically staying the same. It occurred with the Nile when the uh, uh, the Mediterranean Sea dried up and therefore the functional outlet dropped faster than the canyon could carve and so you ended up with this incised canyon it's huge thousand feet deep uh, uh, underneath the Aswan High Dam they found out about it because they did seismic seismic uh, uh, um, analysis when they were Russians were building the Aswan Dam uh, in the 1960s and 70s so all of this stuff makes sense and every shred of that information has to be accounted for by creating is context and until they do until they account for the same set of data not just slices regular science has got the things slam dunk one you see the um the article up, uh, i posted an article up here 100 reasons the earth is old um it's an article i think it's uh age of rocks is the website mm -hmm. it's a guy who is a, a theistic evolutionist um or old earth, theist, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, but basically, yeah, countering he, all of that. Yeah, so, so he's a uh, he's really cool. Uh, it's a really interesting article. Uh, I think my favorite my favorite uh, example from the article is that he talks about the the finer a crystal is, the that means the older it is, uh, and so. Or like, or uh, the like, purer, or, or uh, I can't remember the the term for it. There's a whole bunch of, of multiple variants to produce the gradients uh, at depth and temperature, and and you can tell very precisely about the mix of crystals in a metamorphic rock in particular. Right. These are the ones that really show the indications of how rocks have been thrown up. Uh, Richard Brumby brought up a very nice point in the Q and A in there: how do creationists explain plate tectonics? That is a fun side story. They because don't, if you look at the, but it it's interesting that if you look at the Henry Morris era of creationism in the 1960s and 70s, they denied plate tectonics completely and denied continental drift and said it was just just over the course of the next 30 or 40 years as plate tectonics became more accepted and creationist flood geology became more chaotically un inexplicable. They've had to kind of parasitize that. And so if you go into the Ark Museum, or the, uh, the Creation Museum there in uh, Kentucky now, you'll see a thing where they're asserting with a straight face that the Rodinia supercontinent was the pre-flood continent and that the Pangaea continent was temporarily formed after the flood and that somehow or other than after that, this plate tectonic funhouse turns out to produce the version we have in all those mountain ranges in like a really fast period because remember the flood is 4500 bc and uh, i think the locals were noticing the himalayas there uh kind of early yeah um the uh we were talking about the uh, oh yeah the Paul. yeah so basically the um it's like they have no mechanism by which hydrodynamics can push these these tectonic plates, nor can they explain the remnants of ancient tectonic plates, like the uh, Farallon yeah. plate, which is under California. They just can't. That shouldn't oh, yeah, exist. Well, and, and all both the um, um, uh, uh, Puget Sound area and the uh, um, uh, San Francisco Bay area are just crazy quilts of debris of ancient islands and pieces of plates and stuff that have gotten uh, detritus that basically slams into the plates as they moved. And uh, the, so they're geologically immensely complicated in the same way that, that uh, a lot of the stuff that makes up the Alps is. Paul was grumping quite correctly. Your question came in first. You were asking about Kent Hovind and, and uh, of, of geologic layers. Um, he basically channels um, the old uh, uh, creationist uh, notions, and I think he mentioned that in one of his recent debates there where he's basically talking hydrologic sorting which was the old Henry Morris. Which is also totally bogus. 
it's preposterous because for one thing, the deposits don't actually show that. They show right. ecological relationships. So you'll have big critters and small critters and diatoms and whatever. If it's on a seashore, you're going to find critters that live at the seashore. If you've got something that's living in a high desert, you're going to find particular things there and you'll find sand dune deposits. That every single deposit you can see everywhere on the planet is not some giant slurry that's sorted with little critters and then big critters. Yep. It's stuff that's consistent yep. with what lived there at that time that's now gotten pushed to the point where it's been exposed and you can look at it. And it, the detailed geology is 180 miles removed from the hydrologic sorting crap. And modern high-end creationists don't really invoke that. But that shows you how dated Kent Hovind is. His brain congealed back in the 1980s. And he's essentially repeating the tropes he remembers from his early creationism. Yeah, the um, and also the, and also the, the, uh, the uh, it's, it's the strata themselves the strata aren't themselves sorted by, aren't density. by density. Each strata Each varies strata wildly, wildly in density, wildly and there are even these things called uh, erratics or drop stones, which can be found in the layers. Yeah. Which, obviously, if there was a flood that's supposed to be sorting the layers, like like as you said, uh, then we shouldn't see erratics. We sh they they just shouldn't be in there. You know? Well, they, they can theoretically accommodate a bit of it because they allow one ice age. Oh, they don't want multiple ice ages, and they certainly don't want them spread all over Hell's Half Acre. But <laughs> any, it, if you look at any geological structure, uh, layers in the Earth, and the creationist often you'll hear this canard, there's no single space on Earth that has all the geologic layers in one gigantic pile, which is not entirely true, but is generally so, because erosion yeah. and stuff is stuff around right. but the point is we don't need that for what's in the layers you can see and no matter what you do supposedly if it's fossil bearing it's all got to be made in the flood and that ain't gonna cut it when you look at the exact details of things that you can find circumstances where you'll find big animals farther down and little animals higher up or mm -hmm. you'll find land animals and then you'll find marine creatures and then you'll find other things at all layers and when you look at it and look at the time frame that's involving you can easily see that something that was once a land deposit there's been an ingression of seas and that's changed that and then it shifted over time and then the place dried out and there's some sand dunes later on uh, higher up and it all forms ecological zonations that make sense and it's fun to read that technical literature which i i went into at all times that, that where they'll be connecting things up on the animals that have lived there they can even work out uh inferentially about uh, ocean circulation patterns wind patterns monsoon forms and all of that uh, and you can see these things affecting uh, because differential creatures have differential um, uh, isotope readings. They can often tell stuff about uh, temperature and that from those sorts of things. It's just a fabulous forensic jigsaw puzzle that is so far removed. It's like going from stuff where you would look at CSI level science. You go over to creationism and it's guy waving a bone in front of a picture of something. And it's just that far <laughs> removed from the technical literature, even for somebody like a Snelling who has the technical expert footnotes and all that, but there's always the each point in his argument where he's basically stepping away from the technical literature and saying, well, this is flood. Yeah. It oh, wind patterns in the layers. Yes. The, oh, well, Paul has brought up some stuff here, the scablands. I live on the scablands. For those of you who don't know what the hell that is, uh, that's the uh, volcanic deposits that were produced over many millions of years, not one big gush, uh, the Columbia basalt. And then uh, years later, centuries, millennia later, um, you've got, well, uh, millions of years later, uh, you've got uh, the ice age occurring and these big glacial dammed by ice dams uh, east of me up in uh, Montana. And those broke up again and again and again and you would get these sloshes there have been uh, i think at least a dozen where they would slosh downstream across where spokane is and then down the columbia gorge and out to the sea in fact there are sections along the uh, columbia uh down in the oregon side where there are these valleys where the water what you're seeing are these spillways as water course down the columbia gorge overfilling the hills on either side and 
spillways to go into the area to the south because now the water was too high and it cut gorges through there. I mean, it, 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 you were talking about, I think if memory serves me in, in the larger floods, it would be about 500 feet tall um, at Portland, which means that what used to be the Bank of Oregon building, I think it's a Wells Fargo building now, the big white tower uh, downtown. I think there are some taller buildings now, but that was roughly the water level height um, at, at Portland, which is uh, damned high. Spokane, it turns out, was a little more complicated because they've only in the last five or 10 years realized that because of the drainage systems and that, Spokane was actually under a lake, um, the uh, Lake Columbia, they now call it. And so we never actually, if, if, if I were going into a time machine back at the time of the Missoula floods, I would be going blah, 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 blah because I would be under a, a, a hundreds of feet of water. Uh, and what happened is then, the um, out of these breaking up glacial lakes, they would slosh into Lake Coeur d'Alene because that too was one of these permanent lakes and slosh over into um, uh, uh, the, the Lake Columbia and then slosh downstream. Finally, there was enough erosion away um, in the cycle that it reached the stage where Lake Columbia couldn't be sustained and it drained away completely in the last uh, um, cycle. And uh, we've remained lake free here ever since, but Lake Coeur d'Alene has always been stuff where there's enough water drainage and that coming in that that it remains it. And so you've got these very complicated um, uh, deposits at the bottom of Lake Coeur d'Alene and also deposits that are in a lot of the debris in the bottom of what was once Lake Columbia. And then farther downstream, you've even got some very complicated uh, distribution patterns from the old, um, even earlier Lake Glacial Bonneville that would run down the Snake River into the Columbia. And so some of the stuff that some of them had thought might have been flood material from these Missoula floods was actually earlier material from the Bonneville flooding uh, causing from that breakup. So it's fun stuff down in here. And the geologist keeps developing all the time. And because this is where I live, um, it's kind of a local color bit uh, to figure out how all that stuff works. I actually had uh, the, the dumb-headed creationist uh, that lectured here uh, from Answers in Genesis in 2009 had the gall to try to tell me that the Columbia basalt volcanic deposit was formed in the flood. And I'm going, hey, what? Uh, yeah. how, do you, how do you get uh, terrestrial surface volcanic deposits formed underwater, blub, blub, blub? <laughs> this, this isn't how volcanic deposits look when they're forming underwater. So uh, uh, he's just way too far from the data field on that. Well, uh, uh, we, we just passed another half hour past the time when we were going to pull a plug on this. Uh, <coughs> and we still got 10 viewers. Um, I see you got the uh, blurb up there about the 100 reasons the earth is old. Uh, we have to decide whether or not we want to call. I think we've covered the thing pretty well, don't you think, Jackson? I, I believe so. We, we covered a lot of material here. Yeah, it's something that, it, that everybody who wants to combat young earth creation it should have a good sense of. Um, the more you know, if you want to dive into the things, Google biogeography and look at the geology of stuff, flood defense, learn about the geology of your own area. There's a whole bunch of, of uh, uh, oh God, what the hell are those called? There are uh, the something or other guides. Uh, they're all over the country and uh, as well for every region where it's like a roadside tour, chronics tour or something like that. Uh, 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 the name of the author, I think, uh, um, uh, C R O N I C, something like that. Uh, anyway, they're a wonderful series of things you can find almost every li um, uh, bookstore uh, if they've got any kind of uh, travel log and geology section. But what's interesting is it'll acquaint you with the places that you can literally drive to and look at in your own neighborhood. Gradually, then look up some of the geology and background materials that there's local geology clubs like there's uh, here uh, uh, we have quite a few active geologists that that are in this area that teach at the universities and they get together for their little meetings uh every month and so and do uh, various lectures and that's how i found out about lake columbia and all of that be warned uh geologists are real terminology hogs and they they when they talk amongst themselves they're talking the specific terminology you think lawyers are hard to understand um, geologists are in spades on that. Oh yeah, and, I would agree. Uh, but it's, if you can crack the code, uh, it's uh, very worthwhile because it's the ground we're standing on. It's the reason why things look the way they are. It's no coincidence 
that um, the uh, 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 geology that we know of, when Hutton looked at Sicker Point, and I've got a little mini video up at my um, uh, channel uh, where I went into that, but I recommend everybody know about Sicker Point, S-I-C-C-A-R uh, Point. It's a weird geological deposit up in Scotland that was such a weird layer cake that Hutton had to think through, how the hell did that occur? That it's, it's stuff, how long does it take to lay down something and then get eroded away and tilted and then something else comes along, it gets laid down and fills it in and then it gets eroded and tilted and it was just this jumble that he realized, oh no, this is more than 6,000 years, gang. I've never hmm. seen an effective creationist explanation for Sicker Point or any of these other complex geological structures that really do require time in the same way that your cake can't be baked in 10 seconds just by jacking the heat up in the oven. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Well, I will actually say, yes, we're at 938. Thank you very much, all of the uh, uh, viewers who uh, have been listening to this. And uh, uh, once we shut down and it becomes official, then you can have other people watch it and tell people about it. Uh, we love the conversations. It's wonderful talking with you, Jackson. You who can remember the species name along with the genus name. Oh, fie upon you, sir. And, oh, well. uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, we love uh, uh, interesting topics to come up with. It, it's a good thing to deal with something that's kind of topical in relation to what we've just been looking at in terms of our own research. And remember, we've got a slew of creationists who are praying for us in the administration, and they're running the show, and they're writing the laws on our behalf. And if you're not scary about that, you better start getting scary about it and know the backgrounds of where these people are coming from. The mooch who just got fired. Uh, is kind of a squishy creationist, I suspect. But uh, Pence and these others are uh, people that are actually making important decisions for us. And if they can be screwball on how old they think the Earth is and what they think life is evolving and geology and all these other things and climate change, uh, can they really be making good decisions on other things like where to put that missile and who you want to deal with in terms of ambassadors and stuff? Well, there, was, there was a line from... Uh bones I, I think it was bones um one of the episodes this one of the guys goes to like a, a young earth creationist who runs like a an oil an oil rig or whatever and he says you know when when you guys are drilling for oil you put your you do your science from the bible or whatever <laughs> and the guy's like well <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, uh, Fino was a mark that I'm not scared by them praying as long as they talk to themselves. They cannot write really horrible laws. Oh, but they do actually stop praying at some point, and they do write horrible laws. Uh, I put a little posting up on my Facebook page and on Twitter uh, of a little comment that was put up at uh, uh, well, Raw Story about uh, the prayer uh, meetings that are held weekly that Pence organized, and virtually all the cabinet. And the only reason Pence hasn't been showing up is because he's running amok doing foreign policy. And uh, a guy who thought reparative rep uh, therapy for gays was okay medicine uh, is going to be making decisions on the basis of things and talking to North Korea and South Korea and these various other countries around the world. I am not calm about that. I'm worried about the republic and the rest of the world that has to deal with our republic. I'd probably better think about that whether methods come back and bite you. And I've never seen such a pseudoscientifically inept administration in history. The, the, Reagan and, and Bush and others were had a lot of very competent and effective people in them by comparison. We've got just a gang of the also-rans, and it's a world according to uh, uh, Tony Perkins and the Family Research Council and Jay Sekulow, who didn't surprise me at all that he became Trump's lawyer. That's a guy from Pat Robertson's legal arm. That's Pat Robertson that thinks that God sends hurricanes to Florida to punish them for having gay rights. Uh, this is the worldview that they belong to, how they're in charge of things. And hopefully there will be court cases on stuff and there will be some elections coming down the road that we're going to have to get really involved in and see what we can do about there. So there's the inevitable, oh, we got to pay attention to the politics part, but we got to in a way that you just can't sit on your hands now because things are actually happening. And it worries me as a, 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 a secular person, but even people of religious faith who nonetheless 
want a world in which we don't blow ourselves up or turn into kind of a wackaloon tyranny where Alex Jones is considered normal reasoning. Um, no, I, I can't go with that. Okay, well, we're at 9.42. Uh, my, my inevitable, the end of a finale or, or Tchaikovsky's Third Symphony where he just can't finish it. He's just got to have that long ending and then we have another false ending and all of that. So thank you very much for um, uh, hanging in there. And uh, we'll try to do this again sometime. And thank you, Jackson, for uh, uh, having a chat. And I'll let you go. Uh, au revoir. Au revoir. Aloha from the world of hashtag tip. Troubles in paradise. Well, thank you Hi. for having me. <laughs>